Choices come in various forms. Sometimes we have multiple choices, all of which are relatively equal in merit. Perusing the menu at a restaurant is a good example of that. Now, if you don't really like liver and onions, then you may say that some of them have less merit than others. But from a nutritional perspective, they're all relatively equal in merit. Sometimes we have multiple choices, some of which are superior to others. Should I use my afternoon working in the yard? Or should I use my afternoon to take a nap? Or should I take a walk with my wife? Now you know where the superior part comes. Or should I watch a rerun of an old Ohio State-Michigan game that my team lost? <laughs> now you know where the inferior part comes. Sometimes we have just two choices, one of which is good in comparison to the other, which is not good. That's the scenario in front of us in Galatians, and Paul brings it to a head here at the beginning of chapter 5. Now, you might remember two weeks ago that when we were talking about the previous verses in chapter 4, we actually ended with chapter 5, verse 1. And we noted at that time that that's a transitional verse. It's transitioning from the allegory that Paul lays in front of the Galatian believers in Hagar and Sarah to the application that we're going to find here in verses 2 through 6. So it brings those allegorical thoughts at the end of chapter 4 to a climax and then sets the stage for the two contrasting paths and shows them in stark contrast here in verses 2 through 6. It's the contrast between freedom and entanglement, between liberty and bondage, between faith and works. That contrast could not be clearer than what is presented in verse 1. So it takes us back to that comparison of Hagar and Sarah and then sets the stage for our passage this morning. And that brings us to chapter 5 and verse 2, the path of works. I want to read this passage down through verse 6 for you so that we have that in our minds as we're working through it here this morning. Chapter 5, verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. In verses 2 to 4, Paul makes the point that the path of works has three practical implications for the person who chooses it, and they are all bad. The first of these is, is the, that works exclude Christ. The path of works pushes Christ out of the picture. Paul begins verse 2 by stating firmly and by using his own name. I, Paul, I'm the one saying this. To get that point across firmly. That the choice that they are making has dire consequences. Or the choice that they could be making has dire consequences. If you become circumcised, if you continue down this path, if you side with these Jewish men who have come in to teach you that you must obey the law in order to be saved, if you make that choice, the choice to be circumcised, the choice to follow the law, the choice to walk voluntarily back into bondage. All of that is wrapped up in the phrase, if you become circumcised. 
If you do that, you will also be making a choice you do not want to make. You will be excluding Christ. Now remember, these are people who, for the most part at least, trusted Christ under Paul's ministry. These are people who are Paul's spiritual children, so to speak. And he is telling them that they will be throwing that away if they follow the advice of the Judaizers. Specifically, Paul said, Christ will profit you nothing. If you choose that path, Christ will profit you nothing. Christ will be, no, will be of no use to you whatsoever. And again, contrast. Paul is trying to get across contrast. Light and dark. Good and bad. Works and faith. Paul wanted these Galatian believers to understand that the kind of move they were anticipating was apostasy. A move away from the truth. A move away from the Savior. Because you see, if you're going to depend upon what you can do to get yourself to heaven, then why would you need Christ? Why did he die on the cross? Why did he bear your sins? And suffer the pain of separation from his father. Why would he go through all that if you can do it yourself? If you're going to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, you don't need him. His work does nothing for you if you're depending upon your own work. That's what Paul is trying to get across to them. Of course, the problem is... You can't get yourself right with God. You can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You can't do enough law keeping to make yourself acceptable in God's sight. We needed Christ. We need Christ to be our substitute, to take our sin, to suffer the infinite wrath of the Father in our place. Our efforts are of no use to us. They never have been. They weren't of any use to the Israelites. They weren't of any use to the Jews of Paul's day. They weren't of any use to our forebears in the church, and they aren't of any use to us. So the path of works excludes Christ. Secondly, the path of works, the second implication is that it, it, it connects the path of works that it is not... This is not just about circumcision. It demands an exclusive focus on the law. The choice to be circumcised was a choice to embrace the legalism of the Judaizers. It was the symbolic event that would indicate that they had decided they were going back to the law. They were going to embrace Moses' Moses' law. They were going to embrace all of Moses' law. As with most things that we can do, it's not the single thing, that the single action that is the most important part of what we do. It's what that thing indicates about us that is most important. Circumcision, as Paul will note in a few verses, is neither here nor there. It really doesn't make any difference. It was a simple physical operation. However, if the Gentile Galatians consented to circumcision under those circumstances for the purpose of earning favor with God, they were by that act also consenting to live under the whole law. A lot of what we do is not good or bad in and of itself, but the reasons behind what we do speak volumes about it. Paul taught us that nothing is unlawful by itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful to me, but not everything is profitable. Is it okay for me to skip church and go fishing? Now some of you would say, no, it's not okay for you. You're the pastor. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with fishing. But choosing to go fishing, instead of gathering with God's people to worship, 
says something about my relationship with God, not to mention my relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. It says I'd rather freeze on a lake than be in church. Paul wanted them to see that they were placing themselves under the whole law as debtors, under the whole thing. That meant that they were going to have to observe the Sabbath. They were going to have to bring the various sacrifices that were required. They were going to need to put leprous people outside the camp. They were going to need to stone their children if their children turned away from the faith. You're going to be circumcised? you got to keep the whole thing. Because you see, if you break one, you've broken them all. If you break one, you've broken them all. It's a very tough standard. The third implication is that grace takes a back seat. Verse 4. Verse 4 is something of a problematic verse, and we'll get to the problem in just a moment. But I want to note, first of all, that Paul starts by saying, well, actually, in the middle of the verse, he says, you who attempt to be justified by the law. Paul is speaking in this verse as if they have already made the choice to follow the Judaizers. It doesn't mean that they have. In fact, it's going to become obvious in the next section. We'll see it next week. Pardon me. We'll see it next week in verse 10 that he doesn't think that they're going to fall for this false teaching. He's got higher hopes for them than that. Verse 4, the middle of verse 4 is a rhetorical device to show the consequences as real and imminent. He wants them to understand, if you do fall for this, there are consequences. And he makes two statements, both of which indicate severe spiritual consequences. Number one, you have become estranged from Christ. And number two, you have fallen from grace. And here's where the problem surfaces. It sounds as if these Galatians are in danger of losing their salvation. Now, let's be sure we understand our terms here before we go any farther. To lose your salvation means that at one point you were genuinely saved. And that as a result of some sin in your life, you lose that status of being saved, of being a part of the family of God, and you revert back to an unsaved position with all of the terrible present and future consequences that would go with that. So you're no longer a part of the family of God. You're no longer on your way to heaven. All of those things have gone away if you lose your salvation. The issue at hand, however, here is not a specific sin The issue is the basis of salvation. On what basis were you saved in the first place? Did they place their faith in Christ? Or are they placing their faith in works? Paul's comments constitute a warning to these Galatians. A warning that you have to make a choice. To fall from grace... The only place this is used in the the New Testament is here in Galatians chapter 5. To fall from grace as the means of salvation is to adopt legalism in its place and thereby to be estranged from Christ. Apparently, Paul considered that some of the Galatians had not made a final decision as to whether they would trust Christ or trust their own deeds. To those people, Paul's warning was a statement of either or. You can't have it both ways. You either trust Christ or you trust your own good works. One of the two. You don't get to do both. And by the way, I think that's some of what the Galatians were thinking. We're going to trust Christ and we're also going to trust in our own good works. We're going to cover all of our bases, so to speak. And Paul's saying, no, it's not that. You, you make a choice here. What about those who had placed their faith in Christ, who are genuine believers? What does it mean to talk about being estranged from Christ and 
fall from grace. What kind of a warning was this to them? It was a simple statement of perseverance. You put your faith in Christ, that's where it belongs. Keep trusting Christ. Don't go back in another direction. Don't apostatize here. Don't fall for the line that says you have to do something else besides faith in order to be saved. The answer to our sin problem is faith all by itself. It is faith that grabs hold of the grace of God, not works. Were some of them about to lose their salvation? No. But some of them who had been wavering on how to be saved were considering a deadly choice. And some of those who were already saved were on the brink of deadening their impact for Christ. God's grace, acting in concert with our faith, is the path to salvation. Salvation, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. That's how you get saved. Paul's warning here is to anyone who thinks he needs to add anything to that formula. Don't do it. It's a dead-end street. So the path of works has multiple negative implications. In chapter 5 and verse 5, Paul turns his, his attention to the path of faith. If the path of works is an emphasis on the flesh, and Paul is going to emphasize that point later in chapter 5, then the path of faith is an emphasis on the Spirit of God. And so the path of faith is through the Spirit. Our theme for 2017 is walk in the Spirit. You might have noticed it on the screen before the service started. Walk in the Spirit. And Paul tells us that the path of faith is focused on that Spirit walk. If we, through the Spirit. That's a powerful contrast to the flesh-oriented lifestyle the Judaizers were advocating. What they were saying was, you have to do something bodily physically, in order to be accepted by God. And Paul is saying, no, no, no. No, it's not physical. It's spiritual. If we, through the Spirit, through the Spirit of God, are going to have a relationship with the living God. They didn't live life in the Spirit, the Judaizers. They lived life in the flesh. Now, they would argue that they were good works, those works of the flesh they were doing, but they were flesh-driven works just the same. It takes us back to chapter 3 where Paul reminds us that we receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith, not by the works of the law. And it takes us back to what we read earlier this morning from Romans where Abraham was justified by faith. Not by works. Romans chapter 4 is a strong argument that salvation, that is being right with God, has always been by faith. Some people get the, the, the mistaken impression that Old Testament Israel was justified by works and things have changed and we are now justified by grace. No. No, no, no. Salvation has always been the grace of God through faith. God came to Noah and said, build an ark. There had never been rain. He was building an ark someplace where there wasn't water. If you've seen any pictures of the ark that they have in uh, Kentucky now with answers in Genesis, you know that it was not a rowboat. You were going to have to have a lot of water to lift this thing. What, What Noah did was by faith. What Abraham did, and Paul goes to great lengths in that Romans 4 chapter or passage, what Abraham did was by faith. Abraham was not justified while he was circumcised. That came later, the circumcision. He was justified when he believed. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. We didn't start the Christian life apart from the Spirit of God, and we can't live it successfully day by day apart from the Spirit of God. The Judaizer said you could. Paul plainly disagreed. And the consistent testimony of believers down through the centuries agrees with Paul. 
Legalistic Christianity does not work. You either live the Christian life in concert with the Spirit of God or you will be an unfulfilled believer who is trying to do it on his own. So the path of faith is through the Spirit. Second, the path of faith anticipates glory. He goes on in verse 5 to say that we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. That statement is packed. It is packed. The follower of Jesus Christ has a wonderful future, one that he can anticipate eagerly. What do you do? What, what, what is it that in your life that when you know it's coming, you are eagerly waiting for that? Eagerly anticipating that. When I'm about to do something I really love, like go fishing, I have a hard time sleeping the night before. Looking right at my wife because she's... Yeah, you do, and so do I. <laughs> I'm thinking about that, and I'm running over all my plans in my head. I might even call whoever I'm going fishing with one last time at 10 o'clock to make sure they've got what they're going to... Making sure I haven't forgotten something, making sure they haven't forgotten something. I'm anticipating the fun. I'm waking Jan up and asking questions. Do you have the ice in the freezer? Is there water ready for us? I'm visualizing the fish I'm not going to catch. <laughs> Things like that. I'm eager for the adventure. Well, folks, we have a heavenly future that is worth the eager wait. The eager wait has a focus as well. And that focus is the hope of righteousness. You see, the promise of legalism is an attempt to be perfectly righteous right now. I'm going to do it on my own, and I'm going to be righteous before God on my own right now. It's an attempt that was doomed to failure in Paul's day, and it's doomed to failure in our day. And it has no realistic future focus. Legalism is no different. Never has been. The promise of faith, on the other hand, is that God will one day take our frail, sinful existence away and give us something brand new, sinless, and righteous. That's our hope. And remember, when the Bible talks about hope, it's not... Oh, I hope I catch a fish. It is a sure thing. It is God's promise that we're depending upon. That's the hope of the future. And it's based on faith, not on works. Paul moves on in verse 6 to address the flesh-oriented nature of the sticking point of circumcision. And he says, the path of faith is not in the flesh. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Now up to this point, Paul's been hammering pretty hard on the whole circumcision issue because that's the, that's the issue. That's the issue that's been brought up to these Galatian believers. You've got to be circumcised. So you might gather from this that, that it's better to be uncircumcised. And Paul's saying, let, let me just make this clear. This has nothing to do with your salvation one way or the other. It's not important that you are circumcised to be saved. It's not important that you're not circumcised in order to be saved. Paul's not, Paul's not saying that anybody who's circumcised is not going to be saved. Remember, Paul was a Jew. Paul was circumcised the eighth day according to the law. That hadn't changed Paul was arguing that you, if you were a Jew, your circumcision did not guarantee eternal life. And if you were a Gentile, becoming circumcised did not guarantee that outcome either. And if you were a Gentile, not being circumcised didn't guarantee that. This, what he's saying is this doesn't have any bearing on this. The physical sign of the Old Testament covenant, whether you had it or not, was not the pivotal factor in your walk with God. That sign was a flesh-based indicator in days gone by under a different covenant, under a different dispensation. That's all. The guarantee of a relationship with God was the word of God, which they received by faith, just like Abraham did. 
And finally, at the end of verse 6, the path of faith is the path of love. Paul says the thing that avails something is faith working through love. Now, that doesn't mean faith comes from love, although it does come from the love of God, in that perspective, but that's not what he's talking about. Genuine faith results in love and the good works that flow from it. With this final statement, Paul is actually putting good works in their proper place. They are the result of salvation by faith, not the basis of it. The Apostle James argues the same thing. We won't take the time to to turn to it. But in James chapter 2, in verse 14, he says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that kind of faith save him? He's not saying you have to work to be saved. He's saying your faith ought to result in a changed life. And in verse 18, he says, Show me your faith without your works. That is, show me a faith that does not result in living for God. Show me that kind of a faith, and I'll show you my faith by living for God. I'll show you my faith by my works. Genuine faith will demonstrate itself in a life lived for the Savior. And, by the way, a life lived to honor the Savior in the lives of other people. You don't get saved by what you do but you demonstrate that you're saved by how you live. Paul uses the word love to indicate that the life of faith is lived in gratitude and in love for our Savior and that it works its way out in love for others as well. So Paul is giving you a really strong contrast between a flesh-based approach to life and a faith-based approach to life. A flesh-based approach to salvation and a faith-based approach to salvation. The two are very much opposed. There's a real danger of apostasy. There was in Paul's day, there is in our day. There was a danger that the Galatian churches would fall into this apostate position, a position that took them back into slavery to legalism. And there is a real danger that Christians today can fall into the same trap. Legalism, and I'm going to define it here for you so you understand what we're talking about because the term gets thrown around loosely a lot, especially in our circles. Legalism is the attempt to earn God's favor through human effort. The attempt to learn God's favor through human effort. It is still alive and well. It is the sum and substance of most of the world's religious systems, including many that call themselves Christian. From time to time I hear of believers... That is, people who are involved in Bible-believing churches who have left those churches and gone off to some legalistic church, some church that focuses on works, that says you have to do these sacraments in order to be saved or whatever. And that's the kind of thing that Paul is talking about. So the danger wasn't just for the Galatians then, the danger exists for us today. There is a danger of apostasy. But in point of fact, there is only one way to receive God's favor, and that is through faith in the saving work of Jesus Christ. Salvation is by faith, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. And then finally, the life of faith is the life that works. It's real life, practical Christianity. It recognizes the role of the Holy Spirit at the beginning and throughout life. And some people would say, ah, that's mystical. That's not real life, that's mystical. Let me say, you cannot live the Christian life apart from the Spirit of God. That's as practical as it gets. You must have a relationship with God. 
And when you do, the Spirit of God now has a relationship with you. And you build that relationship over the course of your life as you learn to trust Him, as you learn from Him what the Bible teaches. You must have a relationship with God. And the role of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of, and throughout life is recognized in this life of faith. Secondly, it anticipates the glory of eternity and the perfections that God has in store for us. You know, sometimes you can live this life and you can, you can think to yourself, I'm not sure I'm enjoying this a whole lot. I don't like the fact that as I grow older, my body starts to not work like it used to. I don't like the fact that I open up the newspaper and every article on page one is horrible. Or I watch the news and the only thing positive is the weather report. Sometimes. But you know what? Even though all that stuff is true, I have a Savior who is preparing a place for me and who is coming again to receive me to himself so that where he is, I'll be for all of eternity. So even if the weather is bad, along with all the rest of the news, I've got something to look forward to. That's practical Christianity. It keeps our relationship with God on a spiritual plane and does not reduce it to some physical ritual. Can you imagine if we tried to do all the things physically that all the world's religions demand to be right with God? Just doing Judaism. You know, there were over 600 laws that they had to keep. You start reading through Leviticus and see how many sacrifices they had to, be, they had to take. I'm telling you, I'd have been at the door of the, of the tabernacle every morning all day with a sacrifice until I ran out. It's unbelievable, all the things that they had to do. It keeps... Christianity on a spiritual plane, on a relationship with God who says, I am spirit, and those who worship me must worship me in spirit and truth. It keeps Christianity on a spiritual plane and, and takes away from us this idea that somehow, physically, I can please God. And finally, it results in a life of love-based service. Love for him Love for you. Love for each other. That's the Christian life. Spirit-led, heaven-bound, faith-based, and love-driven. It doesn't get much more practical than, than that. And let me say, legalism cannot hold a candle to that. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Have you placed your faith in Jesus alone? Not in something you do. Not in some act of good work, whether it's spiritually related like baptism or others related like, like walking little ladies across the street or whatever it is you might come up with. If you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior alone, we would encourage you with every fiber of our being as a church family to make that decision today. That is how you relate to God. That is how you become a child of God. By grace, God's grace, through faith.